Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a word from the Lord. James over here with you. Glad you are with us tonight. And uh, we're going to be discussing a comment from the community. A gentleman that we talked to door knocking the other day said something very interesting. And I thought, well, that would be a good springboard for our lesson tonight. But before we get going, I want to give you our content information. If you'd like to reach me, 276 340 2653 at wordfromlord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. And we want you to know we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you, visiting with us if you have the chance. Uh, 250 The Boulevard is where we are there in Eden. And our meeting times are 9 and 10 on 9 a.m., 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings, 7 p.m. on Thursdays. And uh, we're studying First Thessalonians right now. We're about to finish it up. We're uh, going to go into Second Thessalonians when we get done. So if you would like to come out and study the Bible with us, we certainly would be glad to see you. We uh, were door knocking the other day. We met a lot of folks that um, said they would like to come or would come or be interested in coming. So I hope that that wasn't just uh, uh, empty platitudes. Uh, maybe they were they would definitely come and examine the Church of Christ. Friends, the reason why we are so open about this is because we believe we have something that that no one else is going to give you, and that is simply a plain, simple teaching from the Word of God. No bells, whistles. No, uh, no extra creed books or catechisms that, to go along with it. No doctors of men. Just simply going from the Bible. And sometimes what you'll find is you'll find individuals come and they, they study God's Word with us. And what they wind up saying is, I haven't learned so much Bible in such a short period of time. As a matter of fact, there's a, uh, a gentleman from down in, in Burlington who obeyed the gospel a couple years ago. And uh, he drives up. And he's worshiping with us every Sunday. Uh, he's a member of the Lord's Church now, and so he's assembling with the saints as he should. And uh, every Sunday, nearly, he always says, "You know, I've learned more from uh, uh, studying and uh, learning now that I've been a member of the Church of Christ in the past two years than I have in in all my life put together." And it's because we're going right from the Bible, friends. And so, if you want some, if you want to dig into the Word of God, and you want to uh, find some things that uh, God wants for you to do that, that you haven't gotten anywhere else. It's because no one else opens the book like members of the Church of Christ. We study the Bible so that we can rightly divide the word of truth and give you a Bible answer for your Bible questions, and that's what we strive to do. So really hope that you will come out and, and study God's word with us. As I said tonight, uh, we're going to be looking at some uh, uh, statement that a uh, member of the community made to us. Now, the other day, uh, we were out door knocking and uh, met a man, I saw a man that I'd known for several years. I've known him, off, seen him off and on, and visiting with him, and uh, uh, flagged him down, and we were, we were talking a little bit, and he made this statement. He said, y'all are the only ones making any sense. And I thought, you know what, that was a pretty profound statement, and I thought I appreciated it more than he probably realized. And so I want him to know if he's watching, and I think he probably is, I really appreciate that. Because it made me think, you know, it made me think, well, if we're, if we're the only ones making any sense, then what is it that everybody else is, is saying? Because, now he didn't specify what, specifically what we're talking about. He didn't go into detail about certain things that we are taught, but I think overall, generally speaking, he's, I know, I know this uh, uh, person has been to our tent meetings and uh, has, uh, you know, said he watches our program, so I know that that he is uh, probably have a pretty good context of the whole show, what it's all about. And, uh, you know, I don't, so I don't know what anything in particular that he's talking about, but it made me think, well, if we're the only ones making any sense, then what everybody else is teaching is probably not making any sense. And what is it that people are listening to that just doesn't make sense? And if that's the case, why do people continue to listen to it? So I got to thinking, I said, well, you know, what, what is it that, that people are saying that aren't making sense. What are some of those things that just don't make any sense? Friends, I submit to you that if you stop and you put your mind to God's Word, it will make sense. It will be very clear what the will of God is, and it will, it will be like a light bulb going off in your mind. This is so simple. Men come along and they confuse the subject. They confuse the, Bible, the Bible's teaching so that they can incorporate some of their own doctrines and get people to believe what they have added to it, or what men have added to it over the years. But the Bible is really pretty simple. It's a really plain and simple teaching. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 
28 to 30, <clears throat> uh, notice what he says. He says, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your, unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, when Jesus said that, when he, when he talks about his yoke, he's talking about his, his teachings. Uh, let me just put this up here where we can see it. I didn't get my Bible program going. All right, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's what, it's what Jesus said. Now, uh, how is it, or what, is it, what does Jesus mean when he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light? Well, let's look at another verse. Let's look at Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, and let's look at, at verse 9. Now, in the context of Acts 15, Peter, Paul, the apostles, they're all in Jerusalem. They're talking about whether Gentiles should be, need to be circumcised in order to be saved. That was, the, that was the question that was being considered. <clears throat> or whether they should obey the law of Moses in order to be saved, I guess in a, in a broader picture. But notice what, here's what Peter says. Peter says that God put no difference between us and them, that's between, Jew, between Jews and Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Now listen to what he says. He says, now therefore, why, put, why tempt ye God and put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. What was the yoke? It was a system of teaching. It was the teachings of the law of Moses. And he says, we weren't able to bear it. Our fathers weren't able to bear it. They weren't able to keep it all. Why? It was a very, it was a very difficult law. A lot of, a lot of moving parts, you might say. You know, when you start talking about a law, in order to keep the law that had over uh, uh, 600, 700 uh, sacrifices, just as a, as a starting point. I mean, there was a, a sacrifice every morning, a sacrifice every night. So that right there puts you over 700 sacrifices every year, not to mention all the, the sin offerings and the, the wave offerings and the heave offerings and the trespass offerings and the whatever, the purification offerings and this, that, and so forth. A lot of, lot of things involved in the law of Moses. And Peter's like, look, that was a yoke that we can't bear. But Jesus comes along and Jesus says, what? Take my yoke upon you. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light, compared to the law of Moses. So this is a better system. It's a lot better system. Now, if you really want to know it, if you really want to know it, just get back to what the Bible says. It will make sense. It will make sense, but there's a lot of teachings going on out there that just don't make sense if you would just stop and think about it. Now, I know what the denominational preachers are wanting you to say. They're, the denominational preachers are wanting you to go, you know what? Uh, or they're telling you, they may not be saying in this as many words, but they're saying to you, you know, it'll make sense if you just don't think about it. Well, there's a lot of man-made doctrines that do make sense if you don't think about it. If you don't really stop and consider, wait, if that is true, then this can't be true. And that's what we're talking about, friends. And so when, uh, when my friend made this statement, and when he said, y'all are the only ones making sense, it made me think, you know what? There's a lot of things out there that people just don't realize don't make sense because they're not thinking about it. For example, <clears throat> consider this. When people say they're guided by the Holy Spirit, now, friends, I know what the Bible teaches about being guided by the Holy Spirit. I know how the Bible guides. I know how the Holy Spirit guides. I know how the Holy Spirit operates. I know how He directs today. And it is through the Word of God. But listen, individuals today, they'll say, oh, yeah, you need to be guided by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit. Well, if you don't think about, well, what does that mean? Or if you don't ask the question, how? It'll make sense. Oh, yeah, you got a warm, fuzzy feeling. I'm guided by the Spirit. Are you getting chill bumps? Oh, you're guided by the Spirit. That's what they would have you to believe. You know, God talked to them. They may say, you know, God, I, I heard a message from God. He was, I was going down the highway and God spoke to me. I, I heard Elka say that one time. She, you know, she was driving down the highway and she, you know, she was, she was praying and, and all this happened to her. And then you got another guy over here. He was out here in the, in the cornfield or some guy over here, you know, I, I don't know, plowing in his garden or whatever. And God spoke to him or whatever. It's just like they say these things and no one says, wait a minute, 
No one stops and asks them, how does that happen? How did that happen? What did it sound like? No one questions them. And if you do question them, well, you're tr tempting God. But friends, listen, it doesn't make sense if you stop and really consider what they're saying about the Holy Spirit as opposed to what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. When I hear people say, well, uh, God spoke to me or God gave me a vision, God gave me a revelation, you know, my first question to them is, if they say God spoke to me, I say, what does he sound like? And my second question is, what did he say that's different from the Bible? Because if God is speaking to you, friends, he has to have been given you uh, uh, some more revelation. Look at this. The Holy Spirit guided Bible writers into revealing this word. All right? Now, when you understand what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, then it won't make any sense to you for someone to come up and say, well, the Holy Spirit's guiding me, or the Holy Spirit said to me, or God said to me. Listen, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, Notice, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, Peter said, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All right, the Holy Spirit was guiding them to write what they wrote in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, if it was Jeremiah, Isaiah, one, uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, any of the prophets, Moses, <clears throat> the Spirit was guiding them to write what they wrote. As a matter of fact, David said in 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, that the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. All right, it was David doing the speaking. It was David's words that were being used, but it was the Holy Spirit that was giving him those words. And so the Holy Spirit guided men in writing what they were writing and speaking what they were speaking. In John chapter 14, John chapter 14 and verse 26, I want you to notice this. Let's go to verse 25. John 14, 25, these things have I spoken unto you, being, uh, 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 being yet present with you. All right? Jesus says there, you know, I'm, I'm telling you these things and I'm, I'm present with you. He says, but the Holy, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will Send in my name, he shall teach you all things and shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have uh, said unto you. Now, they couldn't remember everything. Jesus was teaching them. He was teaching them, and he was teaching them. For three years, he was teaching them. Now, do you think, do you think they're going to remember everything that he said? And they're going to be able to, to tell people everything that he said? Uh, over the past three years, about uh, about the kingdom. I mean, I'd be I'd be surprised. I've I've been to school, and I've been to some classes, and I'm thinking, you know what? At the end of the semester, end of the quarter, I don't know if I'm going to remember everything. You know, how do you retain everything that's being taught? Jesus said, you know, he's telling them. He said, I know you're not going to be able to remember everything. So the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter is going to guide you into all truth. He's going to bring things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said to you. So they were in charge, or they were, they were given the, the task of revealing everything that Christ said. And they were doing this, as they were doing this, they were writing it down. They were preserving it so that you and I can have, watch this, the Spirit's words in the form of this book. In uh, John 16, John 16, and we're going to look at verse 13. Notice what Jesus says. He says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall say, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit didn't speak of himself. In other words, he didn't, he didn't make something up. He didn't, he didn't insert himself into the process. These were the words that he was told to guide the apostles in. He had a role in bringing the inspired word to us, and that was guiding them in all truth. So he wasn't elevating himself here. As a matter of fact, look what he says in the very next verse. In the very next verse, Jesus said, uh, verse 14, he said, he shall glorify me 
for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. He'll glorify Christ. Now, how many people today, when they talk about the Holy Spirit, they're glorifying the Holy Spirit. Oh, I got the Spirit. I got the Spirit and they're running around. Uh, you know, look like they're doing a uh, fire prevention commercial. I don't know. Stop, drop, and roll is what they really look like they're doing. But if the Holy Spirit was really guiding them, friends, why is it, why is it they act like they do and say like they do, which is contrary to what the Bible says? Listen, the Bible is the Spirit-guided Word. So it doesn't make sense when someone comes along and says, oh, I'm guided by the Spirit, and then they say or do something that's contrary to what we know the Spirit has said. Now, ain't that easy, friends? Listen, tell me what you know about the Holy Spirit that you didn't learn from God, from His Word. Tell me something you know about the Holy Spirit that you didn't learn from the Bible. You wouldn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit except you read it in the book. And yet people all the time tell me, well, I got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is guiding me. He's, he's nudging me. He's, he's doing this and that to me. Friends, he is not doing anything to you separate and apart from the Word. I got an email, uh, I got an email from a fellow uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, up in Oklahoma. He's asking me the same question. He's asking me a question about all these people that teach, they've got the Holy Spirit uh, separate and apart from God's Word. And did I think that was dangerous? Yes, I think it's dangerous. It is dangerous to say that the Holy Spirit is doing something to you separate and apart from the Word of God because then that opens the door for anything. All right? So, you know, it just doesn't make any sense for me. When I hear someone say, well, the Holy Spirit is doing this, and then they're doing something differently. If you want to know what makes sense, what makes sense? What makes sense is saying that the Holy Spirit is operating through the Word of God. That's how God speaks today. That's how God is speaking to you. The Holy Spirit, if you want to know something the Holy Spirit said, it's right here in this book. And by the same token, if you want to hear what God says, it's right here in this book. God is not telling you anything that He hasn't already said in this book. If, if someone comes up to me and says, well, I, I, God... Uh, God talked to me, then I want to know exactly what he said. Because the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear that God speaks through what is written. Notice this. Jesus is talking to the uh, religious leaders of the day, and he's saying, but as touching the resurrection of the dead... Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying? Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying? God speaks, but yet they were supposed to read it. Jesus said, when you read it, you should hear God speaking. Now that makes sense, friends. It makes sense then today for you and I, if you want to hear God speak, you have to hear God speak from this word. If it's something contrary to what the Bible is saying, God's not saying it. God's not saying it. Now, when my friend said, you folks make, more, make, make, make sense, you know, you're the only people that make sense. Well, that's because everybody else is doing things contrary to the Bible, saying that God said something or did something or acted something or whatever that you can't find in the Bible. Now, friends, that's really the... That's really the bottom line. We could really sum up the whole lesson right there. The reason why things don't make sense is because people are going outside the Bible. So it doesn't make any sense to say that God speaks to people. It doesn't make any sense to say the Holy Spirit is acting on people or doing something for someone. That's different than what the Bible says. Because these are the Spirit-inspired words, friends. So it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense for someone to say something contrary to the Bible. Now, I, I want you to stop and think, friends. I want you to really consider. Is this really, is this really what I'm supposed to believe? When, when you hear the preacher preaching and he's saying, yeah, the, 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 God gave me a 
God gave me a verse today. God gave me a message today. I was meditating and God told me this, that, and other. You need to stop and think. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't make any kind of sense. That doesn't make any kind of sense for God to give him a special message in his little, in his little office back there in the back. <clears throat> that, that doesn't make any sense for God to give him some special revelation that's different from this book or outside of this book. It doesn't make any sense. And we just heard, I was talking to, to Blake on the way down here. Uh, I, I said, you know what? I said, I just I made me think about uh, Jessica saying that um, her husband had the Holy Spirit while he was fornicating. And then Caleb, and then Caleb played that. Now, someone might say, oh, yes, that was, so that was the Holy Spirit telling No, friends, that wasn't the Holy Spirit doing that. That was just a coincidence. But you heard it. You know, a man can, can fornicate and still have the Holy Spirit and God's still blessing him and, and using him with the Holy Spirit. Friends, that doesn't make any kind of sense. That doesn't make any kind of sense. Now, we're the ones that are making sense on this matter. All right? Well, what about this? What about when you hear people say, well, my church or the pastor's church? You know, when I hear people say that, I know that when I listen to what the Bible says, that doesn't make any kind of sense. Because when people are talking about their church, when they're talking about my church or their church, they're actually saying they died for it or their pastor died for it. If it's really anything, if it's really any church worth talking about, somebody needed to die for it. Now, that's what I say. Oh, did he die for it? Did he die for it? Look at this. Look at this. Jesus died for his church. Jesus died for his church. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He was going to build his church after he rose from the grave. Now I guarantee you, folks that no other church in the world today, no other religious group in the world today can say that they were started after their founder died and rose again. They all started, they all started by a man and then the man died. Jesus said, I'm going to start my church after I die. I'm going to die, and then I'm going to come back to life. Then we're going to start it. Then I'm going to start it. The gates of hell, the grave, will not keep him from accomplishing his purpose. Now, friend, you say you got a church, your church, pastor's church, whatever church it is. Jesus had a church, too, and he died for it. Matthew 20 and verse 28. Matthew, I mean, I'm showing me Acts 20 and verse 28. Look at this. Paul says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the Holy Ghost, unto, uh, excuse me, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Jesus shed his blood for his church. Now, here's what doesn't make sense to me. What doesn't make sense to me is for someone to come along and go, well, I have a church, my pastor church. That just doesn't make sense to me. Why do you need a church? Why do you have a church? Why are you in a church? If it's not the church of Christ, why are you in it? Why do you need it? It's not near as good as the one that Christ built. See that? And most of the time, these people come along and say, well, what's, what's the name of your church? You say, what's the name of your church? And they go, oh, it's uh, St. Joseph's Episcopal Lutheran House of Emmanuel Prayer Chapel number seven. They have all kinds of names for it. Well, why doesn't why doesn't your church wear the name of Christ? Because Christ's church wears his name. Now here's what doesn't make sense to me. Here's what doesn't make sense to me. Individuals come along and say, well, because you talk about the church, you talk about Christ's church, and they'll say, well, my church is part of the church of Christ. Okay? 
If it's the church of Christ, it would make sense that you would wear his name. Now, it doesn't make sense for someone to say, I am in a church that Christ built, that Christ died for, that Christ shed his blood for. It doesn't make sense to say that I'm in that kind of church and then turn around and say, but I'm not going to put his name on it. I'm not going to put his name on it. You know, we've, we had a standing offer here uh, several times. I say a standing offer. It's, it is a standing offer, but we've made, made it very uh, plain that if someone in the Baptist church or the Methodist church, Lutheran church, Presbyterian church, whatever church, if you really believe that you are part of the church of Christ, put a sign up that says, we are the church of Christ. But no one will do it. I remember several years ago, a lady called in, and she said, she said, uh, uh, well, y'all put up that you're, you're the church of God. You put up the church of God, and we'll put up, we're the, the uh, church of Christ. Man, I don't have a problem putting up a sign that says well, I'm, I'm a part of the church of, church of God. I don't have a problem at all saying that the church that I'm a member of is the church of God. But I can assure you there's not a church of God around here that would put up a sign that says we're the church of Christ. And even and because here's what happens. When you do put up that sign, now you have to prove that you are what you say you are. And really, if you're the church of God, why don't you prove it? Make sure, why don't you verify that it is identical to the, ch to the church of God you read about in this book. See, so, so, so why are these churches wearing all these other names? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to say that you are part of the church that Christ built and then turn around and say, but I'm not going to put his name on. And furthermore, it doesn't make any sense to say, well, the church doesn't matter. Now, this is very confusing. This is why it doesn't make sense. Someone says, well, the church I'm in is a part of Christ, but I'm not going to wear his name. And then turn around and say, well, the church doesn't matter. The church doesn't matter. And then you turn around and insist again that your church is part of the church of Christ. I'm not going to wear his name. I'm not, you're not going to wear his name. The church doesn't matter. But all, all of a sudden, by the way, I am, I'm still in the church of Christ. That doesn't make any sense, kind of sense at all, friends. Why do you insist that your church is a part of Christ's church? Why do you insist that it's part of the body of Christ why do you insist that, that it belongs to Christ and you won't wear his name? You won't wear his name and then you turn around and say the church doesn't matter. That doesn't make any kind of sense at all. That's just foolishness gone to seed. I can see. I can see and that's why I appreciate what, what, my, what my neighbor said when he said, y'all make more sense than anybody. Friends, that's because all of these folks out here are saying, Church doesn't matter. Church doesn't matter. I'm not going to wear the name of Christ on my church. Oh, by the way, I'm a member of the Church of Christ. That doesn't make any kind of sense at all. Doesn't make any kind of sense at all. But yet, what happens when we start talking about the one true church? We start talking about the, uh, the need to be a member of the Church of Christ, that it is the body of Christ, Right? We start talking about it being the, uh, uh, the body of Christ and that Christ is going to be a savior of the body for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is head of the church and he's the savior of the body. When we start talking about the fact that Christ is going to save the body and that the body of Christ is the church of Christ. All of a sudden everybody goes, oh yeah, I'm part of that, I'm part of that. But you won't wear his name and then you want to turn around and say the church doesn't matter. Which is it? No wonder people scratch their head at all these churches of men, all these man-made churches that don't make any kind of sense because their doctrines and their teachings and their philosophies are contrary to the Bible. That doesn't make any kind of sense. But you know what, friends? When you talk to a member of the Church of Christ and you hear us talk about the one true church and how folks who are saved were only added 
to the church you read about in this book, friends, it makes a lot of sense. Why would God add you to a church that he didn't even talk about? If the church that you're in is part of the, is part of the church you read about in the book, find God talking about it. See, it doesn't make any sense to say God approves of what you're doing. It doesn't make any sense to say that God approves of what you're teaching. It doesn't make any kind of sense to say that God accepts the church you're in and you can't find God talking about it. It doesn't make any kind of sense. It doesn't make any kind of sense. Then you have, then you have crazy things. Crazier things, you might say. Things like this, women preachers. Women preachers. You know, you hear, hear people say, well, God calls women to preach. He uses women to preach. He, this, that, and other. Listen to, listen to what, how, how usually the, the uh, saying goes. How they try to justify it. Use women, yes, and they use women to preach. Yes. And uh, I think that that's scriptural, and uh, we we just believe in that. Well, he's actually uh, using a lady to head this Sunday evening. Absolutely, absolutely. Leanne Bray. Leanne Bray heads it up. Leanne is one of our pastors on staff, mm -hmm. and one of our family care pastors, doing an absolute fantastic job bragging on Leanne tonight. <laughs> But uh, she is doing a great job with family care ministry. She has a heart for ministry. She's, 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 she's a great speaker in her own right. Oh, I, just, I just think it's, it's scriptural. You know, God, you, I just I think, I believe, I, I, that's scriptural. Show the scripture then. If it's scriptural, listen, if something is scriptural, friends, the easiest thing, the easiest thing to do to justify it, now watch how this makes sense. If you say something is scriptural, Show the scripture. <gasps> Ding. Boy, a light bulb just went off, didn't it? Oh, I believe it's scripture. I believe it's scriptural. Well, can you show it? Well, no, I can't show it, but I believe it is. The easiest thing, the most common sense thing, friend, if someone says something is scriptural, is to show it in the scripture. Is it not? See? But then people say, well, no one else makes sense. That's what, that's what my friend said. No one else makes sense. You know why? Because people say things like that. Oh, it's scriptural. It's in the Bible. I can't find it. I can't show it, but it's in there. It's in there somewhere. I'm sure it is. I believe it is. Really? Well, how about this? If it's so scriptural, then I wouldn't be able to show... If it was so scriptural, I wouldn't be able to... Uh, uh, I wouldn't be able to do this then, would I? Show scripture that's contrary to it. Uh, let me come on down here. See? 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. If it was scriptural, friends, you wouldn't be able to find scripture contrary to what Jackie Poe just said. But 1 Timothy 2, and verse 11... Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection... But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. Now listen, here's what Paul's saying. Look, he's saying, I suffer not a woman. That is permit. I permit not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. Now can a woman teach? Yeah, she sure can. She can sure teach. I mean, the Bible clearly says that. In Titus, uh, in the book of Titus, let me just get over here. Talk about that. I want you to notice this. Titus chapter 2 and verse uh, 3. The aged women, likewise, that they may be uh, in... in uh, may be in behavior as becometh holiness, uh, not false accusers, nor given to a much wine, good, uh, teachers of good things. What are they supposed to do? That they may teach the young women to be sober, to, have, to love their husbands, uh, to love their children, 
to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that uh, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Yeah, they can teach. They can teach. They just can't teach nor usurp authority over a man. There, there's the difference. They can teach, but God just says how and who they can teach. Someone said, well, uh, you know, well, well, God can call who he wants to call. That's right. He, he sure can. He could. He could call whoever he wants to call. But you know what, friends? He did. He said for men to teach and that women should not teach nor usurp authority over a man. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto her, unto them to speak, but they may be under the commandment, but they are to be, uh, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also said the law. All right, now, where did you get the authority? See, that's what we're talking about. It's not about can they; it's about do they have the authority. So it makes no sense. For someone to say, well, God called me to preach and then turn around and find scripture that shows just the opposite. You know, I think a very good uh, illustration is one by Brother John Shannon. I'm going to let Brother John Shannon uh, do a little teaching here because I believe this is a, a very good illustration that uh, that he used. This is from a tent meeting uh, a few years ago. And we're going to, I'm just going to let him teach on women preachers here for a minute. Well, maybe not. Here we go. The devil's false agents. Watch Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, do you know his ministers? Now, some of them, women preachers. There's one on television called Joy Smile. How many of y'all saw it? You saw it, didn't you? Right. Why is she on television? I mean, who? L listen, the girl can preach. There's some black women on television. Martin Luther King Jr. has got a daughter in Atlanta. She's a fantastic preacher. Okay. She can do it. But the question is not ability. The question is authority. Uh-oh. You didn't get that, did you? Leave your keys in your car, in your Cadillac car. And here's old Joe Blow come around with his pants hanging down and his hat turned to the side and he sees the keys in your car. He can drive your car just as well as you can. Here's the difference. Ability and authority. Oh, you see it. No, that's good. Isn't it? That, that's simple. It's not about ability. It's about authority. Sorry, caller. Call back. I was trying to get through that video clip. But call back. We'll take your call. See, friends, that's what we're talking about. It's not that women can't do some things. It's just that they're not authorized to do certain things, like preach or teach or usurp authority over a man. It's just that simple. So when someone says, well, I think it's scriptural, I think it's scriptural, and then like Jackie Poe, you said, she's a pastor. Friends, there is no scriptural authority for a woman to be a pastor. A pastor is the same as a bishop, is the same as an elder, same as the presbyter. And they have qualifications, and one of those is to be the husband of one wife. There is no way in God's green earth that a woman can be the husband of one wife. It's just not possible. The only way she, she would ever even come close to being that is if they started changing the definition of husband and wife, which it wouldn't put a pastor because they try to change the definition of everything else. But even then, friends, that doesn't change what God said about it. God said the husband of one 
wife. There's no way, there's no way that a woman can be a pastor. A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now, it just doesn't make any sense for someone to come along and say, well, yeah, we can be pastors, and, you, and, you're, and you're a woman. That doesn't make any sense. You're on the word of the Lord. Hello? You're on the air? Yeah. Um, I know this preacher, Paula White, sends me letters every time she prays for me, and she sent me a letter saying the Lord was going to get me out of my laziness, and somehow he worked it out where I was with New Hope, and I get to go to the Y for free three times a week, and I'll lift weights. And she sent me another letter saying something about the Lord. Sometimes the Lord starts from the end, and she prays the Lord will reveal his uh, plans to me. Uh, my name is Jerry Eastham. Uh If you want to make a comment, go ahead. Okay. Now, so let me make sure. What Now, what, a woman sent you a letter? Well, her name is Paula White. She's a pastor. Okay. All right. And she she always prays for me every every uh, blue moon. Okay. Well, here's my thing. You're saying she, one, first of all, a woman pastor. Now, did you hear the verse I just read? In yes. in First Timothy three, verse one, the Bible says a bishop, and that's the same. That's the same thing as a pastor. All right. A bishop must be the husband of one wife. Now, can she be a pastor? Can a woman be the husband of one wife? Well, I don't. I know a little bit about the Bible. I don't know one hundred percent about the Bible. Well, the thing I know is that um, everything that she is, uh, two of the things. Well, one of the things she has said okay. came true, and, and the things in her CD she sent me came true. Okay. So I, I'm just saying the way though, I can put it. Okay, but here's my here's my comment to you: is I'm trying to show you that she doesn't have any scriptural authority to call herself a pastor. Now, is she doing what God says when the when the Bible says a pastor has to be the husband of one wife? Can she be the husband of anybody? She can only be a wife to one guy. All right, but she can't be the husband. It right. doesn't say the wife of one husband. It says the husband of one wife. Right. So my, my point is, I'm trying to start right here. When Paula White claims to be a pastor, she's already violating the scripture, regardless of what, what letter she sent you. Now, mm -hmm. let me go, let me take the next step. All right. She sends you a letter and says she's going get to you, get you out of your laziness. Well, well you no. Know, she said the Lord was going to get me out of my laziness. And before I knew it, I was with New Hope. I have a provider that takes me to the Y three times a week, and I lift weights. And we go to the mall, me and my provider, go to the mall and walk around. Okay. Are like you disabled or something, or what? Uh, I'm disabled. Okay. So, but here's my thing. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that you haven't been, you know, that's a great blessing. But mm -hmm. that's not because she prayed for you. She's not even in good standing with God. That's my whole point. How can, a, how can someone who is violating what God says be then turned around doing what God says? Well, that just doesn't make sense to me. Is, you know, I, I know she's a preacher. She, I've seen her on TV. Well, I know, I, know, I know she can preach, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about does she have authority from God to preach? I don't know. Uh, like well, I said, I don't know 100% about all this stuff about preachers, women preachers. and um, But I have changed my mind. I mean, I do like women preachers because uh, I believe she had that calling because she she's in communicating with the Lord because she's telling okay. me things that has came true. But, sir, you know what? I mean, here, here's, here, here's what. You can say you like her, and I'm saying this is what the Bible says. The Bible says... Let your women keep silent in the churches. It's not permit, permitted for them to speak. Now, how can a woman be a preacher and obey this? How can a woman be a preacher and not speak in the church or not teach nor usurp authority over a man? 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. <clears throat> how can she do that? I don't, I don't know. I don't know that much about the Bible. Well, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, she can't. I got in trouble a long time ago, 
and that was the start of my of me getting on disability because uh, I mean I had no evidence that I was disturbed or paranoid, and then all that evidence came to light before the disability judge. Uh, my grandmother had something to do with it. My ex boss man, my ex teacher had a lot to do with it, and it was like a, a God sent blessing to me. Well, here, here's what I'm gonna, I'm going to give you another verse, sir. Second okay. Thessalonians. 2 and verse 10. The Bible, Paul says, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they have received uh, they have rece received not the love of the truth that they might be uh, saved. Now notice this. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now sir, this is what I'm telling you. I'm showing you scripture about how Paula White and those like her are disobeying God. They cannot, with God's blessing, do what they claim to do. Therefore, they can't speak for God and offer you the things that they say are from God. Now, I'm showing you scripture. I'm right here on the screen. I'm showing you scripture. Okay. And, and what concerns me is I'm showing you scripture and you're saying, well, I still believe in women preachers. So that, that really concerns me. Well, I believe in women movement, movement and if, if they want to be preachers, uh, I mean, one time I was against it. I didn't believe in it, but, uh, I, but uh, I do believe in it now. Okay, but do you believe what God says? But do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the Bible? Yes. Well, how can you believe the Bible and then believe that what Paula White is doing is acceptable to God? Because the Bible says oh. she can't do it. She doesn't have the authority to do it. Well, like I said, I don't know know 100% about the Bible. I understand what you're saying. Uh, I just don't understand it 100% about the Bible. Okay, well, but and, I'm saying uh, this, though. I got the uh, Bible on CD, the King okay. James Version and the Old Testament. Well, that's good. That's, and, uh, that's, that's a good. That's good. I, love, I do love the Bible. Well, here's my, and I'm glad you do, and I want to encourage you to consider this. If someone is telling you that they're doing something that you know the Bible says is contrary to what the Bible says, that they're doing something contrary to what the Bible says, then shouldn't you say, I'm going to listen to the Bible and not what this person is telling me? Well, I, I, like I said, I believe in the Bible, but I also believe in, in the women's movement. Well, no, I'm not talking about the women's uh, movement. You, I'm not talking about... Well, you can't. I'm, I'm not talking about women's equality. I'm talking guys, about I'm talking about doing guys, and we can't sir, we, we can't fight the women's sir, movement. Sir, we're not talking about the women's movement. We're talking about what God said a woman can yes. do in His church. Yes. Now He said a woman cannot preach, teach, nor usurp authority over a man. That the women are to keep silent in the churches. Now you can are you going to go with what God says or what Paula White says? Well, I want to go with the Bible, but I don't want to go against the women. Oh, well, my friend, you know what? I, I don't want to be I don't want to be standing by anybody on the day of judgment except God. I want to be on God's side. I don't want to be defending women. I, well, I do too. You, you, but well, but it, but you see what I'm saying? You're telling me. You're telling me. You're more concerned. You're more concerned about being politically correct, really, than you are about being with God. Well, I'm saying God, God, I, I, God says a woman cannot teach nor usurp authority over man. And you're saying you're concerned about the women's movement. Well, like I said, I believe in the women's movement. And it's, it's not about the they, women's they, movement, though. They have the right. It's not about the women's movement. It's not about do they have the right to do it. They can, they can get up and preach all you want to. But it's not by God's authority. God did not say they could do it. He did not give them permission to do it. Now... The video, the video that I played just a little bit ago, were you able to hear uh, uh, no. Brother John Shannon? I'm mute on one. Okay. Well, this video that I just played, this one right here that's behind, the, behind me on the screen, was Brother John Shannon, he made this illustration. He said, let's say you are driving, you got a car, and you got the keys in your car, and someone comes along and drives your car. Now, do they have the ability to drive your car? Yes. Yeah. 
but do they have the authority to drive it? No. No, that's exactly right. I'll tell you another illustration. It's like this. If I go into the bank and I see the teller up there, she's counting out $100 bills. Mm -hmm. You know what? I could say, you know what? Why don't you let me come around there and count that money? You know what she's going to say? Because I can count money. I mean, wouldn't you like to count some $100 bills? Yeah. You know, all right. I can count money. You can count money. But you know what the difference is? It's not about what we can yeah. do. It's about do we have the authority or permission to do it? And we can't do that. Well, and so, well one thing is Paula White's been real good to me, and, and I would never turn my back on her. Well, Thank you, sir. Bye. All right. All right. Well, you're going to turn your back on God. God is the one that's ultimately giving you all these blessings, you know, and you're saying they're coming from, from a, a, a woman that is disobeying God. Friends, that is a sad, sad story. I hope that, I hope maybe get in touch with this gentleman, get his name, I'll get his name again uh, at, when I go back and watch it. But friends, it's sad. That is very, very sad for someone to say, well, I'm not going to turn my back against someone who's disobeying God because they're helping me in this life. You know what, friends? This is what we studied tonight in, uh, in, in class. Uh, 1 Timothy First Timothy 4 and verse 8, Paul said, bodily exercise profit little. Now the gentleman talks about he's getting to go to the Y or whatever, lift weights and three times a week. That's great. I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad that opportunity is open for you. But you know what? Bodily exercise profit little, but godliness is profit to all things, having a promise of the life that now is and that which is to come, and that is to come. We're concerned about the next life, sir, we're concerned about what's going to happen after this life is over. Now, someone might do some good things for you and help you out in this life, but the bottom line is if they're not helping you out to get to the next life, they're not doing you any favors. Paula White is not doing you any favors, sir. She's in blatant rebellion in disregard to God, God's uh, word. And I hope you consider that. Friends, that just... You know, here's what doesn't make sense to me is for someone to, to know or to see that this is what the Bible says. This is contrary to the Bible. And, but, but, I, but then they say, I'm still going to go with this person. That just doesn't make any sense to me. All right. Well, we're, we're about out of time. We'll, get, we'll try to get one more here. What about this? Uh, one call. All right. You want to work with the Lord? Uh, turn your TV down, if you would. Turn your TV down. So we can hear each other. Okay, okay I'm turning it down now. All right. I, I don't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't call to argue, or I didn't call. To, I just wanted these the scripture that you're quoting. Is it is the majority from the Old Testament or the New Testament? The on um, women preachers. Uh, which, which verse are you talking about? Uh, everything I've used tonight, I'm pretty sure it's from the New Testament. Everything you have quoted tonight comes from the New Testament. I'm pretty sure. I can't think of anything I've quoted from the Old Testament. Majority of them are from the New Testament. That's what you asked, yes. Uh, okay, all right. Thank you very kind. Of okay, sir. all right. No problem. All right. All right. So, so, yes, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about, friends. It just doesn't make sense to go contrary to the Bible. Let's get one more here. Uh, we'll try to skip down here for a moment. Let's get this one. The sinner's prayer. Now, this doesn't make any sense at all. Just like me, yeah. they won't go into a church, brother, uh -huh. to get saved. Yeah. But they can sit there in, the, in front of the TV. Tell you what, I'm going to take this phone call. You want to work the Lord? Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fine. I, agree on, I'm, I want to talk about the, the women preacher. Okay. I agree with you on that. But I also I agree with you, and I just want to ask the people that listen, can they show? Can they tell us where in the Bible that God said for a woman to preach? God himself. Not nobody else in the Bible, but God said. Right. And I've been asked that question a lot. 
And I, I go on TCT and ask what the pastor say, and I try to ask them. They won't even answer my phone call <laughs> because I asked that question. Imagine that. Well, that's a good question. I mean, and, and it, it, it is interesting to notice that when people are doing something wrong, you show them the Bible, they never, they never have to show you a scripture, you know? Yeah. They'll, they'll want you to show a scripture why they can't, but they never show a scripture why they can or why they get to. Uh -huh. and, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's, I think what you're saying is right. It's, it's a shame. It's a shame that, that, uh, you know, we're always giving a defense or a reason why we believe. You know, Peter said, be ready, always give an answer to every man that uh -huh. asketh you. But for some reason, these denominations never give an answer. They never give a reason. They never give a scripture. Why do you think that is? Because they don't, for that right there, I know they don't have one. Because <laughs> there's nowhere in the right. Bible that God himself said that for a woman to preach. A woman's supposed to be the backbone of a man, not the head. She's supposed to be the backbone. So a woman calls herself preaching or preaching, she's the head. She's over that man. So I mean, I always been to it. I always been believed in you know. So I've been in church all my life. I always believed that the way I came up is that the woman supposed to be the backbone, not the head. So I, like I said, if if anybody can call in and I will listen because I want to know. You know, if you can tell me where in the Bible that God Himself, nobody else, God said a woman supposed to preach. Right. I, I like to hear. It. Right. I would too. All right. I, where, where are you calling from? Eaton, North Carolina. Okay. All right. Come by and visit down the boulevard. All right. Thank all you, right. sir. All right. Have a good night. All right, friends. We're about our time, but that was a good call. So, uh, well, let me just wrap this up. We're starting to talk about, uh, you know, we're the only ones that make sense. That's what a member of the community told us. And, and friends, I just want to say this. There's a lot of things that men are saying that just don't make any kind of sense. But we make sense because we're using the Bible. So friends, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If what we're saying is making sense, why not be with us? Wouldn't that make sense? What doesn't make sense is for individuals out there watching to say, hey, y'all doing a great job, but yet you're not a member of the Lord's church. Now that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Friends, thanks for your watching. Thanks for your attention tonight. We'll put our content information up here if we can assist you in any way. We want to do that very thing. Stay on the line, callers. I'll talk to you after off the air. But we've got to wrap up. Till next time, friends, always making sure that what you are getting is from the Bible and a word from the Lord. Have a good night.